Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today's lecture is part of the Conservation Lecture Series. Before I introduce our speaker, I ask for those in the audience to please hold all questions until the end. And for those of you tuning in online, to please type your questions into the chat box, and we'll make sure to address them at the end of the lecture as well. Today, we're pleased to have Dr. Brian Seifer presenting a lecture on San Joaquin Tit Fox. Dr. Seifer is the Associate Director and Research Ecologist with the California State University Santa Slaw Endangered Species Recovery Program. Since 1990, he has been involved in research and conservation efforts for rare or endangered animals and plants in California. Although he enjoys working with a variety of species, his primary research interest is in the ecology and conservation of wild canids. He's worked with wolves, coyotes, gray foxes, red foxes, island foxes, and kit foxes for over 25 years. He has been working with San Joaquin kit foxes, the topic of his presentation today. Please welcome Brian Seifer. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for inviting me to be your, your next uh, lecture series speaker. So it sounds like you've had a, a pretty good string of um, lectures. And I'll, I'll try not to, to break the string. So um, as Sarah said, yeah, I've been working with San Joaquin kit foxes for about 25 years now. Um, and so I've accumulated a bit of knowledge, I think. I hope uh, you can be the judge of that today. Um, but also just a lot of material, and so I'm just going to jump right into it. So your, your big mistake was giving me a two-hour slot, so mm -hmm. we'll see if I can get through everything um, in the course of the, the presentation today. Okay, so the, the presentation outline today, I would like to give you a quick overview of uh, kit box biology and ecology, just to kind of get you situated on um, you know, some basic information on these guys, and then we'll talk a little bit about why they're endangered and their current status. And then some of the conservation research that's been conducted um, over the last couple of decades or so, uh, much of it by our group, and then some of the conservation needs uh, going forward. So, okay, this is this is kind of the cliff notes here. Um, so, for the overview, Volpes macrotus mutica. So, uh, San Joaquin kit boxes um, are a subspecies of kit box. Uh, depending on how you want to slice and dice the DNA, um, as many as eight subspecies have been defined. Sometimes only two. But no matter how you dice it, it uh, San Joaquin kit boxes always come out as being a distinct subspecies. And they are found in arid habitats, so they are desert adapted. So that's kind of a theme I, I want you to, to really kind of grab onto, particularly as you're thinking about, you know, habitat quality and, and areas that are suitable for these guys. Again, remember they're, they're desert uh, adapted. So um, very small, uh, only about five pounds or so. You know, so about the size of a house cat. Uh, those of the folks in the room here can kind of see the. Uh, Freeze-dried specimen that I brought, and that's as big as they get. That's a, that's a full-grown adult female. Uh, they eat primarily nocturnal rodents, um, rabbits. A lot of insects we're finding out, particularly when the rodents are down, they do quite well on insects. Again, they're desert adapted. They don't need free water. They get everything they need from their food. Uh, coyotes are their, their main predator, and they are primarily nocturnal. And every day of the year, they do use a den. So they're, they're kind of unique among canids in that uh, swift, or kit boxes and, and closely related swift boxes use a den every single day of the year, not just during the breeding season like most canids. Um, so again, uh, dens are used all year. They're socially monogamous, and then they've been endangered since 1967. <coughs> and we'll talk uh, a little bit more about why that is. Okay, so this is where, are what kit boxes are not. Um, these are some of the, the critters that commonly are confused uh, with kit foxes. Uh, so red foxes, gray foxes, coyote pups. I get a number of inquiries every year uh, from people who say, oh, yeah, I've seen a kit fox, I've seen a kit fox. And I usually try to get them to, to send me a photo. And if it's from an urban area, then 75% um, of the time it's a gray fox. They're very common in all of the East Side Valley towns now. The other 25% of the time it tends to be red fox pups. If it's out in the non-natural habitats, um, so out in the, the natural lands, um, not natural, I wouldn't think it's quite right. This is in the non-urban habitat, so out in the natural lands, 90% of the time what they send me are uh, pictures of coyote pups. So easily confused with kitty boxes, particularly in a spotlight or off at a distance or something like that. Um, and so this is kind of the accepted range. This is based on CNDDB uh, locations. Um, as you can see, you know, Definitely kind of uh, concentrated down in the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley and over in the western area. Again, these are the more arid habitats. As I said, they're desert adapted. Um, there are a number of locations, you know, kind of up in the, the northern part of the range, over in the Salinas Valley. Um, you know, 
Remember, I've mentioned those coyote pups in the confusion. I think I'm a little suspicious of a number of those locations, particularly since a lot are based on, on spotlight observations, and it's really, really easy to confuse um, coyote pups and, and uh, a kid pups at a distance at night. So anyway, you can kind of see where they're, where they're mostly concentrated there. And so this is what their, their natural habitats look like. So again, you know, these very arid habitats, very arid grasslands and shrublands and uh, stalkless scrub habitat, alkali sink habitat. Um, so this is, uh, this is down in the low Kern area, that lower image. The other is Buena Vista Valley over in, in western Kern County. So you know, kind of the common theme is that it's very gentle terrain, flat to gentle terrain, uh, very, very low structure, you know, a lot of bare ground showing. Um, and again, they, they just don't want to get bogged down into you know, dense vegetation. So, and usually very, very sandy soils for the most part. Uh, you start getting about 30% clay content, and um, it's just really hard for them to, to burrow into to areas like that. And this is what they look like out in those areas. Sometimes, you know, that, that image on the, the left there, they can you know, almost look like a moonscape. But um, they're always, you know, these areas support a lot of nocturnal rodents, even when it looks like that. And that's really what these guys need, um, just a, a really good prey base. And they're not too concerned about um, you know, a low you know, or even absent vegetative structure. So um, like I said, it, those are arid habitats. And this kind of emphasizes that a little bit more. This is from a, a paper that I helped out with um, that uh, Dr. Dave Germano down at Cal State Bakersfield drafted up. And this sort of defines what's called the San Joaquin Desert. And it, it's mostly that red and then the yellow areas that, you know, we, we basically use a number of desert adapted species to kind of define that range. And again, you know, you can kind of particularly look at that red and then to some extent the yellow. And those, that's really the, the high quality stuff uh, for kids boxes. So, uh, dens, I mentioned dens before. Uh, they use a den basically every single day of the year. Uh, dens are a very, very important integral part of uh, their ecology. And so they use dens to avoid predators, um, avoid temperature extremes. Again, desert adapted. You know, it's very, very, very hot environments. Um, so they go down into these dens during the day. Uh, so they'll, again, use those for daytime resting, moisture conservation, usually nice and humid down in those dens, and then for rearing their young as well. So again, they use dens for you know, many different aspects of their ecology. So very, very important to them. And is what a typical den looks like. It kind of has, you know, it, it, it tends to be a little bit taller than it is wide. You kind of think of the, the shape of a kit box going into a den. They want that, that opening to be as narrow as possible so large predators can't follow them uh, into that den. And then there usually tends to be a big uh, dirt berm that's kind of kicked out as they kind of dig that, that soil out and kind of keep backing up and you get this huge berm, you know, that kind of behind them. Um, a kit box will use, on average, about 11 dens during the course of the year. So these dens are kind of scattered all around their home range. And so, you know, when they're out foraging and they get, you know, encounter a coyote or some other large predator, hopefully they're never more than, you know, a couple hundred yards from a den that they can duck into. And so they'll kind of use a den for a while, um, you know, a period of days, maybe weeks, and, you know, they, they probably do deplete the, the local prey populations in those areas. And then they'll kind of move to another one kind of keep circulating around, but yeah, about 11, 11 dens per year on average. You know, some will use over 20 dens per year. Um, so it, it just kind of depends on what's available to them. Again, you can kind of see that long berm. This one was over 20 feet long and that, that keyhole shape again. You know, these guys just kind of kept digging and digging and digging and, and kicking that dirt backwards. And this is what a natal den looks like. Um, you know, the whole area is just really kind of denuded of vegetation for the most part from the activity of the pups tends to be these multiple entrances. These are very, very traditional, and, and they're also very, very dynamic. Um, so, you know, they're, they're dynamic in the sense that um, the pups each year will, you know, they're just little diggers, so they'll kind of keep creating new entrances, and some will collapse over time. And so, you know, every year they'll kind of look a little bit different, but every year it tends to get a little bit larger. You know, like I said, they keep coming back. Once they've successfully produced pups, in a den, then you know, that's a safe spot for them. So we'll keep coming back to those natal dens. Those, those are, are, are very important to them. Okay, in terms of their food habits, um, I kind of gave you the, the quick rundown before. Nocturnal rodents, particularly heteromyid rodents like kangaroo rats and pocket mice, you know, these are a real staple for them. They can take rabbits. It's a little bit tougher, kind of akin to a coyote pulling down a deer, you know, for a kid to take down a big old jackrabbit, uh, but they, they can do it. 
And then lots of insects, such as Jerusalem cricket there, and we're, we're finding more and more that these are just wonderful little snacks for these guys. Uh, when Jerusalem crickets are abundant, they'll go for them, but they'll also eat a lot of beetles, grasshoppers, other crickets. Um, and particularly when the, the, the rodent populations are down, the kit foxes do quite fine on the insects, other than the fact that they don't seem to be able to pull off a litter of pups. But condition-wise, you know, the adults are just in fantastic shape. And in the, the San Joaquin Valley, or in the ecosystem that's available to these guys, um, you know, in many locations, there are three different kangaroo rats that are, that are available. So the one on the left is a giant kangaroo rat, which, of course, is an endangered species. One in the middle is the Hearman's kangaroo rat, dime a dozen. Uh, they're, they're probably the most widely distributed. And then uh, the San Joaquin kangaroo rat on the right. In this case, it's the, the short nose subspecies. Um, there's also Tiptons and Fresnos are part of that same complex as well. Um, so, and again, I know it's probably a little bit of a regulatory nightmare. You have this endangered fox eating these endangered kangaroo rats. That, you know, turn about is fair play because those endangered kangaroo rats are probably eating endangered plants. So, which we have a number of in the valley. So, but yeah, that's for the, the regulators to figure out. Um, but yeah, that, that's just the ecosystem that we live in here. And so this relationship between uh, kit foxes and kangaroo rats was recognized way back, you know, even by Grinnell and, and his associates uh, back in the early part of the century. You know, they, they noticed that kit foxes seemed to be at their highest densities and to do best um, demographically in areas where there were lots of kangaroo rats. So there definitely is a strong tie there. Um, these guys, you know, do seem to be kangaroo rat specialists, essentially. And so this is just a, a graph that, that shows some of the, the data we collected at Elk Hills, where I, I started working in 1990. Um, so that's the red line. And then I superimposed uh, that onto um, kangaroo rat abundance from over on the Elkhorn Plain. And so you can kind of see, you know, we have an ecosystem which actually is relatively simple in the respect that it, it's very much bottom-up driven. So, you know, when you get rain, prey goes up. Kit foxes reproduce and their numbers go up. Um, when you don't get rain, then you know there's there's nothing for the kangaroo rats to eat. Their numbers go down. Kit foxes go down, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. This is actually kind of following precipitation patterns, a, a very very strong relationship there. Uh, the other thing that just sh it shows you is just how naturally dynamic the populations are, not only for the kangaroo rats but also for the kit foxes. You know they they can just fluctuate wildly. Uh, just under natural conditions, and again, it's all just you know precipitation related. At Elk Hills, it was interesting. In 1991, we saw this was at the end of a seven-year drought. The populations were at their lowest. Uh, the rains came, and you know the prey shot up pretty quickly, and, and so did kit foxes. And then within three years, we saw the highest population that we had seen out there. And so in that whole 15-year span, we saw the lowest and the highest, and in, in just about a three-year span. So. Again, very, very dynamic uh, populations. Uh, in terms of home range size, um, general rule of thumb, these guys in good quality habitat, a kit fox family will need about two square miles of, of space. So, um, and that's kind of what you're seeing there. Uh, elk hills, uh, those were studies that were done in the western Kern County core area, high quality habitat. Again, roughly about two square miles. Uh, that Carrizo study, that was done during a drought period, so again, it kind of shows you what happens when, you know, the prey just bottom out, and, and the, those numbers were basically collected during the end of that seven-year drought, and as you can see, the, you know, the, the, the whole range size just went way, way up. Uh, the Northern Carrizo, that was a, a study that we completed not too long ago. Um, again, kind of a little bit more marginal habitat, so you can see the, the home ranges are a little bit larger there. Semi-tropic was interesting. That's one of your ecological reserves. Um, they're really, really high quality habitat, but also just kind of a, a fairly small habitat patch. So those guys are just really packed in there, and so the, the home ranges were relatively small between the density of foxes and the quality of the habitat. You know, they were able to get by on, on a much smaller area. And again, a little bit about two and a half square miles in those low current studies. And again, low current is a real high quality habitat. And this is an example from that northern uh, Carrizo project, and you can kind of see um, in that area, um, you know, you, you usually have a couple of circles that are on top of each other, and so that's a pair. That's a male and a female. Uh, down in the lower right there, there are three. That's actually a helper fox um, that's also, you know, still using its parents' home range. Um, and not a whole lot of overlap in, in that habitat. 
contrast that with the data from the semi-tropic ridge area. And again, as I said, that's kind of a smaller habitat patch, higher density, real, real high quality, particularly right along the ridge. Let me see if I can get my pointer to work here. That was next. Okay, that's, anyway, that's this area. I'm going to step away for a second here. Right here is that ridge uh, where you see all those circles that are kind of all overlapping there. And so they were just really packed into that area. That animal in the darker blue, that was an animal that wasn't using the ridge exclusively. It was kind of getting off in some other areas and see how much larger his home range is. So, you know, that's a little bit on the space use. Okay, in terms of um, mortality factors, so kind of segueing into to demographics a little bit, uh, coyotes are the main predator for these guys. And this seems to be uh, not so much a, a predation thing as a competition thing. It's called interference competition. You know, when, when one animal either excludes another or actually kills it. Um, and coyotes will kill kit foxes. They don't actually hunt them, but if they get the opportunity, you know, they will kill a kit fox just because they view it basically as a competitor for food. And that gory scene is kind of what it looks like. Um, they, they, they'll run them down, grab them, shake them, and then just drop them. And by that time, they've, you know, they've caused uh, significant internal injuries. And, but they rarely consume them. Uh, bobcats are a whole other story. Um, in areas where bobcats are present, they will hunt and consume the kit boxes. And we've seen this on a couple of occasions where we'll be tracking one of our collared animals. We get to this little disturbed patch and dig down, and there's a partially consumed fox down there. So that definitely is a, a, a predation event. And they go after them. Red foxes, you know, these are non-native um, to the San Joaquin Valley, to, to get fox range in general, but they are increasing and expanding. Um, we've had, oh, really only about three occurrences that we know of that where we know a red fox killed a kid fox. And um, so it doesn't seem to be a very common occurrence. And um, I doubt it's, it's ever going to be a significant mortality factor because the reds are pretty much limited to agricultural areas and urban areas. Um, they don't really do well out in the natural lands because um, they just get nailed by the coyotes out there. And so that's, that's kind of where the coyotes are good news, bad news for the kid foxes. They will kill kids, but they keep the reds out of those areas. So. Um, that's a good thing. So all in all, I don't think they're a real significant mortality factor. Uh, some of the other species that have been documented to kill kit foxes are golden eagles. Um, again, we don't get a whole lot of this because you know, kit foxes are nocturnal, golden eagles are diurnal. So uh, not a whole lot of um, overlap in, in terms of activity patterns. Uh, badgers, um, they'll kill them on occasion. Um, and, and we think that this is just really kind of almost more accidental or opportunistic, you know. A badger kind of wants to move into a den and there happens to be a kit fox there. All in all, I don't think it necessarily wants to kill the kit, but if the kit tries to defend the den, then, you know, they'll probably kill them. So uh, badgers will, will win that battle. And then vehicles are um, an another big source of mortality uh, throughout the range. And again, not a, a huge source. All in all, they seem to be relatively adept at getting across roads. Um, but, you know, they don't all make it, so uh, that's probably the, the second biggest cause of mortality for kit boxes uh, throughout their range, vehicles. Um, in terms of contaminants and disease, these are kind of very, very more localized mortality factors. Uh, the contaminant issues we're mostly just seeing in urban areas or near urban areas, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Disease doesn't seem to be a real big factor with these guys. Um, so some of the diseases that really hammer some of the other tainted populations, um, these guys seem to have some amount of resistance to. So with, with a few exceptions, which I'll, I'll mention later, there's been just a couple of, you know, only two cases of, of rabies that we know of. Um, there's been a little bit of distemper in some desert kit boxes, but even that didn't go too far. And then there's been a mange issue in Bakersfield, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little while. But all in all, disease doesn't seem to be a big problem for these guys. So that's good news. So kind of summing up, these are the, the main mortality sources uh, for kit foxes. Again, you have predators, coyotes, bobcats, domestic dogs in some cases, um, badgers, red foxes, and then some of the larger raptors. And we documented at least one kit fox in Bakersfield that was killed by a great horned owl. And I guess, and, you know, I'm assuming that, that probably does happen on occasion since the owls, of course, are nocturnal too. Just that kit foxes aren't where there are trees, which the owls like. So. Uh, again, it's probably not a major thing. 
vehicles, um, toxins, both rodenticides and contaminants. Um, you know, kid foxes have died of those. Entombment, uh, like I said, they like these really sandy soils, but sometimes when we get these real big gully washers, you know, of, of rainstorms, uh, some of those natural dens will actually just collapse, particularly if they're alongside a, a wash or something like that. And then some illegal killing still goes on, people, you know, trapping them, whatever. Okay, so probability of surviving, uh, these are, you know, uh, survival rates here uh, from the low current and now killed areas. Again, that's in the western Kern County Courier area and over on the Carrizo Plain. So, you know, roughly about uh, half of the adults will, you know, make it through a year on, on average. Um, you know, kid fox that makes it to three and a half out in the wild, doing pretty good all in all. I mean, they, they can live to 12 in, in captivity or in urban situations, but uh, out, in, out in the natural lands, I think the oldest we've seen is maybe six, and anything over about three and a half is, is actually doing pretty well. So uh, life's pretty tough out there. For, for the pups, only about 10% of them make it through their first year. So kind of segueing into social ecology a little bit. So here's kind of a quick summary of their social ecology. The basic social unit is a pair, so that's the adult male and the adult female that, that will breed. Helpers may be present, um, particularly when the densities are high, we see more of this. And it tends to be a female from the previous litter that will stick around and, and provide some assistance to you know, her mom to raise the next year's litter. Uh, they are monogamous. They will mate for life. But extra pair copulations are common. Um, the males will you know, mate with his female. Then he'll try to sneak over to the neighbor's home range and try to mate with that female. Of course, while he's doing that, the neighbor's coming over to his home range and trying to mate with his female. So. All in all, it seems to be increasing genetic diversity, so uh, just get more mixing that way. But yeah, a little game that they play, you know, not 100% not faithful. Average litter size is right around four. We've seen litters, though, as big as nine. Uh, and then the young can begin dispersing as early as four months of age. Um, and they may delay dispersal for you know, some number of months, so like later in the year, or even for a couple of years to see if they might, you know, basically inherit that home range from their from their parents. As I said, the mortality rates are pretty high out there, so you know that that's kind of a gamble that they take. They may, you know, forego reproducing for a year or so, but then they may inherit this home range that they're familiar with. Like this, um, they can breed in their first year uh, biologically, but most of them do tend to wait until their second year before they actually breed. That's kind of a social ecology. So here's some pups that are probably about um, five to six weeks old or so. And so these guys are, are born about middle of February. Um, and here are some pups that are probably toward the end of nursing. They're, they're, they're probably eight weeks or so. You know, by about eight to ten weeks, um, by, by ten weeks they're definitely weaned. And that, that process probably, you know, starts at around six weeks or so. And here are some that are fully weaned. These guys are, are about ten to twelve weeks old or so. And um, and so here's the, the chronology for reproductive events. So basically, they're, they're pairing up in November, December. If they're not paired already, um, but they're beginning to you know, think about uh, breeding at that point, you know, late December and January. And this is a, also a time when we see the dens become very, very active. The females will go in and just start clearing out those, those natal dens in preparation for the pups. Uh, parturition, or, or you know, when the pups are born, that's usually right around mid-February. Could be as early as uh, mid-January. Sometimes it's as late as early March, but right around mid-February is the, kind of the median point. Uh, nursing occurs from February into April, and then weaning from March to May, and then they become independent in May and June, and then basically any time after that they could disperse. Um, and so in terms of reproductive rates, again, this is from that low current area, the Elk Hills area, uh, the Carrizo area. Um, and you can kind of see the reproductive success there. Again, very, very variable. You know, roughly about half the females will be successful. And by success, we measure that um, is, you know, as being, we actually see pups emerge from the den. Because the pups will stay down in the den for about the first three to four weeks or so. And so then if we see pups emerging from the den, then, then we consider that to be Production. But you can kind of see the, um, the ranges there, you know, at Elk Hills was anywhere from 20% to 100% um, reproductive success, just again, depending upon conditions that year, food availability, that sort of a thing. That Carrizo study, again, was done during a, a severe drought period, so the reproductive rates were a little bit lower over there. 
Um, you can kind of see the, the mean litter size, again, pretty close to four, except on the Carrizo, where again, it was a drought period, less food available, so uh, litter, litter sizes were a little bit lower there. And, um, you know, when they disperse, generally they only go about maybe one or two home ranges over about, so three to five miles is about the average dispersal for a fox. But sometimes they get a bug, particularly some of the adults, and they can move some distances. We, we've uh, documented a couple that have moved over 100 miles. Um, and again, that's pretty rare because, you know, dispersal is always a pretty risky proposition. You're just exposing yourself, you know, you're getting into areas that you're, you're not familiar with and that exposes you to predators, roads, things like that. So, but they can move some pretty good distances, um, you know, when they get the, get the bug. Um, I'm not sure what sort of caused them to do that. So that's kind of an overview on their biology and ecology. So now we'll move into the second part, and you know, why are these guys in danger? They were listed originally in 1967. Um, they were listed by the state in 71. They're still on the list and probably not coming off anytime soon. So this is the range for all of kid foxes. As I said, San Joaquin kid foxes are just one subspecies. So the little blocks that you see in central California that's separate from the rest, that's the range of the San Joaquin kid fox. And so right off, you, you know, can quickly get the sense that even under historic conditions, they were not that abundant. They were kind of confined, you know, to a relatively small area. And this shows it pretty well. So this is the San Joaquin Valley. And um, down, down in this area, you know, you have the, the Mojave Desert, of course, just on the other side of the southern Sierras. And during a, a probably what was a warmer period, um, you know, 10, 12,000 years ago or so, Kit foxes, as well as some other Mojave species, kind of slopped over into the, the San Joaquin Valley. Um, you know, leopard lizards did, antelope squirrels did, um, beaver tail cactus did, and a number of other species. And then conditions changed a bit, and, they, and those species pretty much just got isolated in the San Joaquin Valley, most kind of down in the, the southern and western part of the valley. Again, these are, you know, Mojave equivalents, ecological equivalents, you know, desert species, so they're going to stick to the, the more arid areas. But bottom line is that they got isolated over here, and then, you know, most of them evolved just enough that they became distinct subspecies, or in some cases, even distinct species. But again, even under the best of circumstances, you know, it's not like there were gazillions of, of these guys. And so now they're, they're kind of locked in the valley here, and so this is what the habitats looked like in the valley historically before European settlement, and, you know, the grasslands and, um, particularly kind of that darker yellow of the salt bush and alkali sink, you know, that, that's really the primo stuff for kid foxes. Again, you kind of see there wasn't a ton of that, even historically. And then there were big, big chunks of the valley that were, you know, marshlands and wetlands and things like that, um, not kid fox habitat at all. So um, a lot of those areas are dried up now, and, and there are kid foxes in some of those areas, but it's definitely, you know, those areas usually aren't a prime habitat for them. So anyway, there wasn't a whole lot of that to begin with, you know, the really good stuff. And 1885, of course, the valley started being settled more and more. Agriculture started developing. You know, that continued into the 1900s. And as you can well imagine, you know, you, you guys all know the end result. The story just gets worse and worse over time. Uh, as agriculture expands, um, as the cities begin to grow and expand. And so this is kind of a depiction of what it looks like today. So a lot of those natural habitats are gone. Basically about two-thirds of, of the grasslands and uh, those, those um, uh, scrub communities are gone now. So, um, and so that's, that's the main reason that they were listed. Yeah, back when there was some hunting and trapping and uh, predator control programs and things like that, which, which probably affected their populations. But it's this profound habitat loss, which really is, is kind of doing them in. Um, so, again, that's the main reason that they were listed, um, and, and so these are, again, just kind of pictures of, of the, you know, the, the types of land uses that are just eating up land on, on kit box and other species as well, um, you know, intensive agriculture, industrial development, like oil fields, so they'll, you know, kit boxes can persist in those to some extent. Urban areas, again, they can persist in some of those. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but generally those do exclude foxes. And then more and more we're seeing these very, very large solar projects going in that are eating up quite a bit of land as well. So those are all the factors that are, are kind of working against kit foxes and, and some of the other species out there. 
And so we did a, a little bit of suitability modeling to try to figure out, okay, with what's left, you know, where's the good stuff? And so this is pretty important. It's like we, we want to identify where those good areas are so we can really target those for conservation. Um, and so I'm just giving a real, real quick uh, overview on this. This is some GIS modeling that um, uh, Scott Phillips with our program primarily did. You know, I kind of provided the inputs. He did all the, um, the modeling magic. So I can barely spell GIS, but Scott is, is just a real wizard when it comes to this stuff. And so we started out with these three factors as being, you know, kind of the most important ecological factors for kids' boxes, terrain ruggedness. And basically the pink areas are areas that are less than 5% slope, and then the darker blues are 5 to 15% slope. And then land cover and use, so the high suitability areas, again, are kind of, uh, you know, dry grasslands and, uh, so, um, and scrub communities, alkali sink and sulfur scrub communities. And then vegetation structure, and uh, he used um, NDVI, um, uh, basically satellite data that were collected over years, um, kind of averaged all of that stuff to find out, you know, where was really kind of the low structure, uh, the areas with the low structure, some bare ground showing, and then ran that through his model. For those of you who do know a little bit more about GIS, this was basically the model up here, and produced this map. And so that's, that's what's left. And the, the pink is the highest quality habitat, the blue, moderate quality. To be totally honest with you, um, what we're calling moderate quality is really kind of generous. We don't know of extant populations, and, and trust me, we've done a lot of surveying work, but we don't know of extant populations in those dark blue areas. All of the, you know, those areas kind of function more as it seems like, um, you know, habitat, dispersal habitat, things like that. Um, some years you might even see kit boxes expand into those, and those years tend to be the drought years. So kind of like we're seeing now, we've actually have seen an expansion of kit box activity in the last couple of years, just because as those areas dry out, the vegetation becomes sparser and actually more suitable for kit boxes. Um, but more, you know, all the extant populations that we know of anyway are, are in those pink areas. So again, just not a, a whole lot of that left. And we feel fairly confident about the model in the sense that we had an opportunity in working with um, you know, some of the scent dogs, uh, with Debbie Smith and, and her group. Uh, we had an opportunity to do surveys all throughout the valley. And the dogs are pretty good at, at finding, you know, kickbox signs. And so where you see green, that's where they found the sign, you know, uh, a fresh kickbox scat. The bigger the, the circle around that area, the more scats they found in that area. Uh, the red are areas that they surveyed that didn't find any. And so you kind of see anywhere there's kind of, you know, mostly dark blue. They didn't find anything there. Um, you know, the, the first, furthest north that they found anywhere up in the Pinocchi Valley area. We also know that there's a little population just a little bit north of there, which I'll, I'll show you shortly. But um, so again, you know, this sort of kind of gave us a little bit of ground truth thing uh, to the model. So again, we, we feel fairly confident in, in the model results. And so what are the implications of that model? Um, so there was a, approximately 1.4 million hectares of high and medium quality habitat. That's the, the pink and the dark blue. A kit box home range averages about 544 hectares in high quality habitat. And so again, even if we kind of cheat a little bit and assume that that medium stuff is high quality, um, which we know it's not, and we're not even sure there are kit boxes in that stuff, but still, if we kind of cheat a little bit, that still only gives us, you know, a little over 2,500 home ranges. And so assuming two breeding adults per home range, we end up with a little over 5,000 foxes. And then are all the caveats, though. But most of that remaining habitat is that medium quality, um, where certainly home ranges would be larger if there were foxes there. And again, we're not even sure there are foxes using those areas. Um, there's a lot of fragmentation even among the pink stuff, and, and you, you basically need, as I said, two square miles just to support a family group. So any of those little pink patches that are smaller than that, they're not going to be able to support a family group, uh, much less a population. And not all the habitat is occupied at any given time because there is a fair amount of population turnover, and we talked about predation rates and, and whatnot. And so the bottom line is that we think there are much, much fewer than even the 5,000 breeding animals. And you know, the number that um, keeps coming to me is about 3,000 or so. And even that might be a little bit generous. And to kind of put that into some perspective, that's about the number of pandas that are left in the world. So 
you know, there just aren't a, a, a huge number of these guys. Um, so definitely need some help. And then how much of that is conserved? So this is an image that I, I stole from one of your compatriots, Dave Hacker, who, who did a real nice job. He kind of took our model. And then with the green and the yellow areas, those are the areas that are, are permanently conserved. And as you can see, not a whole lot of that, certainly the pink, let alone the blue, is actually permanently conserved at this point. You know, the biggest chunk is down in, you know, the, the, uh, the southwestern corner there. That's the Creaso Plain National Monument. Um, and then, you know, a lot of EERs, of course, your ecological reserves, those are permanently conserved. Um, actually, it's not shown on here, but down on the lower right, that, that kind of thin strand, that's the home ranch, that's, that's all permanently conserved now with conservation yield. But there's just not a lot of stuff over there. So just not a whole lot of the stuff is locked up at this point. And that, that's where we have some work to do and, and some opportunities for conservation as well. Um, and we need to be quick about it. And like I said, we really need to focus on those pink areas because, again, these are some images that Dave put together that I borrowed. But the conversion is still happening at a, at a rampant rate, um, you know, to the, to the tune of thousands of acres of year, a year. And you know, I, I know you guys are dealing with it, particularly, you know, those of you who are kind of in the regulatory arena, you're getting calls all the time. Uh, so this was an area over in Kalinga back in 94, you know, Nice saltbush scrub habitat, and that's what it looks like, you know, 11 years later. Um, and Dave was just kind of cruising through Google Earth and just sort of looking at before and afters, you know, not, not all that long ago before. You didn't go back to 1930s or anything. This is just the, you know, 1990s. But again, some nice stuff over in the Kayama Valley, and that's what it looks like now. So it's all been converted as well. So, and we're just seeing this, you know, every year. So again, um, that, that habitat is still just disappearing on us. There is a recovery plan, so as a lot of you probably know, that was drafted in 95, approved in 98, and it basically defines three core areas, uh, you know, the Creasel Plain core area, the Western Kern County, and then the Hero Pinoch core area. And so that's where our largest remaining populations are, with one exception, which I'll talk about later in the talk, that being over in Bakersfield. Um, and then there are some kind of smaller satellite populations kind of scattered around. Probably not more than about half a dozen of those, though. So, um, so yeah, things are getting a little bit slim for these guys. And a lot of even what's left is not really being managed the, the best as it could be. So, um, you know, a lot of the areas, you know, particularly as you kind of start getting into the central part of the valley, northern part of the valley, kind of look that like that area on the right side of the fence line, just really rank, really dense. Not the areas that hitboxes really like. What they kind of like is that stuff on the left, which is in gray down. So um, that's, that's, again, an area for improvement. So here are some guys that are you know, just out there. This is in the low current area again. Um, in, in, you know, again, good quality habitat. This is in the middle of one of those core areas. A nice, happy family group there. Um, but anyway, so those are all the things kind of working against the foxes. Just, just like I said, we've already had this really profound habitat loss, and it's just still continuing. So um, that's why they're probably not going to come off the list anytime soon. Uh, probably going to continue to be on there for, for a while yet. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the conservation research that's gone on. And I, I just kind of opened up with some of our, our trapping procedures and so much of the, the work that we do is, is actually, you know, trapping and, and radio collar and kit boxes and, and then tracking them and, you know, to monitor demographics, ecology, um, you name it. Uh, this is always fun for us, of course, get your hands on the animal. Um, we don't have to drug them or anything like that. You know, they, they're very, very easy to trap. Um, kind of a good and bad thing, good from a research perspective, maybe bad from their perspective. They'll, you know, you throw a hot dog into something and they'll blunder right into it. No other self-respecting canid would go near anything like that, particularly a cage trap, but these guys go right in, uh, relatively docile to handle, you know, we get them in a bag and just kind of expose the parts we need, and then in the end, when we're done, we, we let them out, and then usually they'll kind of run away a little bit, turn around, kind of look back at us, see what was going on, see if we're still chasing them, or just kind of check us out. They're, they're very, very curious. Some are very, very curious. <laughs> so there's one that popped out, um, and then just really wanted to kind of look pristine over. This is kind of a younger animal. And hung around there for actually quite a while, just sort of checking her out, sniffing all the equipment and whatnot. As I said, they're, they're pretty curious. 
Uh, others get a little more indignant. Um, so this one got let out and let us know what, what he kind of thought of us and everything that just happened to him. So, um, but yeah, they, they can be characters at times. So, but yeah, definitely, definitely fun handling these guys. So one of the, the studies that we did back in the early 2000s, 2001 to 2004, was to look at competitive interactions between kit foxes and coyotes, just to you know try to get a, a more quantitative assessment of, of just how important that competition is. Um, initially going in, we, you know, we know that coyotes are the main predator. They do kill foxes. On the other hand, everywhere there are kit foxes, there are coyotes. So, um, and yet, you know, the kit foxes don't persist in those areas. But we wound up um, collaring, I think, about 68 kit foxes. This is down in the low current area. And then also, actually, with the help of the department uh, capture crew, helicopter capture crew, we wound up handling um, uh, 10 coyotes and then tracking them as well. And it was kind of interesting, you know, given a choice, the kit foxes will exhibit some amount of spatial separation. So the coyotes were primarily using the shrubby areas, which are in green there. And that kind of makes sense. They kind of like more cover. Um, that's where most of the rabbits are, which are the, the main food for the coyotes. The kit foxes, on the other hand, they would go into those shrubby areas and, and forage a little bit. For the most part, though, their home ranges were kind of out in this more open area. Um, it's not a true grassland. This is an area that had been burned intensively, and the shrubs, you know, not being fire adapted because they're desert shrubs, uh, didn't haven't really come back uh, even even today over to fire. Uh, but that's where the foxes were hanging out. That's where, you know, there were a lot of kangaroo rats out there, very, very open spaces. They could see the coyotes coming from a distance. So uh, that's where they tended to be. That's where most of their den locations were as well, um, was out in, in those more open areas. So again, given, given that opportunity, they will, um, you know, kind of stick to the more shrubby areas. So the shrubs, particularly as, as the density of shrubs goes up, that's just more cover for the predators. So. We did find that there was a little bit of spatial separation. Um, and interestingly, um, but all in all, yeah, we, we, we did really find that the coyotes were a limiting factor to the kit foxes is, is the bottom line on all of that. And we looked at, again, you know, all sorts of things, you know, food competition, you know, the, the direct predation, all that stuff. Um, a little study that I helped out with in Texas with swift foxes, they actually took one of our artificial den designs, so I'll talk about artificial dens in a little bit, and they actually scattered them all throughout the landscape, and these were just escape dens that they put up on the surface of the ground. And they actually did see a, a bit of an increase in swift fox survival in those areas. So again, then, you know, the more escape cover you can provide for these guys, then, you know, that, that does help. Again, I don't think the coyotes were necessarily a limiting factor to the swifts out there, but it, it definitely helped them a little bit to, to have this extra cover. Another study that we did also at the same time as we were doing the coyote work was to look at road effects. And so this again was in the low current area. On the right you have Route 58. On the north it's, it's low current road. And then on the west side you have Route 33. So you know, we had all of these you know, very, very busy two lane uh, roads in that area. So we figured, well, this would be a, a, a good area. It was actually kind of difficult finding you know, roads that were going through a good quality habitat where we could do the study. But uh, so this fell fairly well. And again, you know, we were, we were looking at, you know, 60 some animals over three years. And I started with that shadow thing and then I thought I got rid of that. Um, bottom line on this is that um, in the three years, we only had one of our radio collar kit boxes that, that was killed by a vehicle. So um, they seem to be fairly adept at least getting across these two lane roads. Um, again, the primary causes of death were predation and, and some other things, um, mostly predators. But uh, only one was, was hit by a vehicle, and it was that poor guy there. Just, um, so that was kind of the good news. You know, in areas where you just have these two-lane roads, um, you know, the news isn't so bad. And what does help is, again, these guys are nocturnal, and at night, traffic does die down, so it does make it easier for them to, to get across those roads. And indeed, they were going across those roads. So these, these are the, the movements of our, our radio collared foxes. And they, they were just routinely going across the roads out there. Um, and we looked at all sorts of variables, you know, den placement, food availability, um, you know, mortality rates, um, uh, reproductive rates, and just really didn't find any differences. Um, so you know, our conclusions were that two-lane highways do not appear to directly uh, impact hitbox survival, reproduction, den placement or use. 
um, their movement patterns, uh, prey availability, uh, food habits or competitor abundance. Again, we, we looked at all of those factors. But, you know, the, the caveat that we're always quick to, to offer up is that um, these results may or may not be applicable to larger roads. So, you know, when you have something like other states in particular, I suspect it's a whole different ball game there. Um, and so, you know, out in some of the habitat, it certainly doesn't hurt. You know, they do have signs like this on occasion to, um, you know, kind of slow down for the species. Where so I come from in Kern County, this usually means speed up. So, uh, another project that we've worked on, uh, and this has been in with collaboration with some of your colleagues up at the, the Wildlife Investigations Lab, is looking at rodenticides. Shadow thing is really annoying. I thought I'd get rid of that. But anyway, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we've basically been sending carcasses up there for probably the better part of a couple of decades now. Um, inter interestingly, there have been exposures, rodenticide exposures, usually more than one rodenticide, in 74% of the urban foxes uh, that we've submitted, but pretty rare in the non-urban animals. So again, that's kind of good news. We're just not seeing a whole lot of rodenticide issues. Um, out in the natural land. Most of this is the, the really toxic second generation type rodenticides. Um, mul exposures to, to multiple substances seems to be common. Where exactly they're getting the stuff, we don't know, you know whether the, the exposures are primary or secondary. Um, and the work is still ongoing because the EPA has been modifying uh, some of their restrictions on rodenticide use, uh, largely in response to a lot of the work that's been, been conducted in California. So. We're still sending carcasses on up there from you know, both the urban area and the non-urban area. And we'll see if, if the exposure rates go down with the, you know, the new restrictions that are in place. So, but that's kind of an ongoing project. I mentioned artificial dens before. Um, back around 1999, 2000 or so, we had an opportunity to actually look at a bunch of, of different den designs uh, to see if kit boxes would use those. So if there was an area where den availability was limited, then maybe we could we could supplement those with artificial dens. And so we, we tried a number of different um, designs. Some of these were just on the surface. Um, and I'll show you some pictures in, in, a, in one entrance, two entrance. Some had chambers, some didn't have chambers. And we tried metal and plastic and PVC, uh, concrete, and then a couple of different chamber types. Just um, you know, irrigation valve boxes, those kind of green boxes that just you see buried in your yard and then igloo dog houses. And uh, so this is what one of the surface dens look like. And you know, basically it's just a, a piece of pipe on the ground that then gets covered with soil. We usually try to get more um, on, on these than you know, just the covering there. You know, it's good to get about a meter of soil on there to give us some thermal insulation. Uh, some are very, very simple, just kind of a pipe slanted into the ground and you know, with the back open so that they can kind of expand out from there, basically make their own chambers and whatnot. And then some got a little bit fancier with two entrances and there's, there's one of the, the dog loose styles down there. Um, and so we just wanted to see you know, what they would use. This is again a, a one entrance, that's that uh, corrugated uh, plastic pipe that seems to work pretty well in one of the irrigation valve boxes. And we basically found that they use pretty much everything we put out there. So they don't seem to be terribly fussy. They did seem to, if they shied away from anything, it was probably the metal. And I don't know whether it's because, you know, the, the whatever a little bit of that metal is exposed probably heats up and maybe, you know, transmits the heat down or something. Um, but, you know, all of the other uh, materials, they, they seem to be happy to use. So our recommendation is, is to go with that single wall corrugated black plastic pipe just because it's a little bit cheaper, easier to work with, it's lighter weight, it's got corrugations on the inside so they can kind of get a little bit better footing. And so that, that seems to work pretty well. And then chamber-wise, you know, uh, both the, the dog glue and, and the irrigation valve boxes um, work fine. We did have other critters that liked our dens just as much as the kit boxes did. So, and that was always a little bit of a surprise. So we were monitoring them for a couple of years to see, you know, if the kit boxes use them and who else was using them. So skunks would show up in there. We did have some red foxes move in. This, this is all done in Bakersfield. Uh, a lot of feral cats like to use them. So we got some other critters that kind of moved in as well. So you just never know, never know. But we, we were happy to provide the, ha the habitat for somebody.
that was one of our studies, um, and they actually did reproduce in these as well. So in general, it, they seem to prefer urban dens, um, but you know they will reproduce in the artificial dens as well. There's a pup poking his head out, a couple more sitting outside in one of the artificial dens. So you know, we, we did have a number of litters that were produced in the dens. So that was good news for us. And so this is the den that, or the design that we you know usually recommend, just going with the irrigation valve box with you know holes cut into the side of it, and then the corrugated plastic pipe kind of coming in. The other thing we like about this is it, it bends a bit, so it's not just a, a straight shot. You know, something can't look right down into the into the den box, so we can get a, a, some bends in these pipes. Um, so that that's just kind of the basic design that that, that we recommend for, for people artificial dens or wanting to put in artificial dens for one reason or another. So I talked about some of those larger roads. Um, we actually did get an opportunity to do a project where we were trying to see what sort of crossing structures these guys would use. And um, we had a hard time finding sites that had big roads and good kickbox populations um, at the same location in the San Joaquin Valley. So we actually swapped over into the, in the, into the desert and used uh, desert kickboxes, the surrogates as well. So one of the study sites was along Route 58, and you can kind of see some of the, the types of um, structures that we were monitoring, and then just some of the issues, you know, they can kind of get clogged up with junk out there over time. Um, this was the one study site that was over the San Joaquin Valley. This is along I-5, through uh, the current water bank area. And again, you can kind of see some of those, you know, um, structures can easily get choked with vegetation, they can get flooded in the rainy season. We did have this one big overpass that we monitored as well. This was out of the Route 14 study site. Um, again, you know, it's kind of a, a nice diversity of structures. And basically, we didn't document kit boxes using any of them. And you know, we, we were monitoring for over a year with track stations, cameras, and everything. We did document on a number of occasions, uh, mostly based on road kills, where foxes seem to prefer to go over the roads. They really just don't like to go into structures. You know, something like the two on the left, I suspect that they would use because they're big, they can see light going through there, but, you know, the bigger the better, um, essentially, when it comes to crossing structures. These little ones over here on the right and anything smaller than that, um, I don't think a, a self-respecting kit fox will actually go in there. It's just too scary for them. It could be coyotes or bobcats hiding in there. You get much smaller than this and they actually kind of use those as artificial dens. They won't use them as a crossing thing. They'll just kind of use the entrance as, as a den, essentially. Uh, but yeah, so the bottom line was they, so this is still kind of an information need is to see what structures work best, particularly as roads just get bigger throughout their range. You know, what, what might be a good good crossing structure for them? Because right now it just seems like their preference is, well, they want to stay on the outside and, and just go, try to go over the road. Of course, that's, that's hazardous. One of the other projects that we've been contributing to is genetic work. And again, I'm not going to try to explain hardly any of this, because just like I can't spell GAS, I can barely spell DNA. Um, but this is work that was done by the Smithsonian, and this is from Tammy Wilbert's uh, dissertation, which just came out in 2013. And so we have been sending you know, as many samples as we could find, plus she was getting some from the search dog crews that were working, particularly up in the uh, summer in the Carrizo as well. Um, obviously, some areas are not included in this, um, you know, areas like the Kayama Valley, some of those smaller populations that are, that are out in the valley. Um, but what this is basically showing is that uh, there were three kind of distinct genetic genes, essentially. One was up in the kind of Pinocchi region. Uh, one is over in basically the, the Carrizo area. It's really kind of the southwestern part of the valley. So that CR, CAR, LOK, that's Camp Roberts, Carrizo, and Oakhurst. All those grouped together genetically. And then Bakersfield also was fairly distinct genetically. So, and you know, Dave Hacker saw this and, and actually had a good suggestion. Maybe these are the core areas that we should sort of be focusing on for conservation. But, um, and the other thing that Tam Tammy did find was that there did seem to be some exchange that was still going on, although she couldn't really tell whether that was kind of a bit more historical or current, you know, something that's going on right now. But um, anyway, that was just kind of one of the main results from her dissertation, and, and here are some of the other conclusions as well. Um, good news, all the populations seem to have high levels of genetic diversity, whether it's because those males are cheating or what's going on, I don't know. 
Um, but they, they do still have good diversity. Um, every population does seem to have unique alleles, so that, that's good. Um, the three major groups, as I pointed out, with unique genetic signatures, Cerebral Panoche area in the north, Camp Roberts, Creuso Plain, Lokern area in, in, down in the southwest, and then Bakersfield over in the east. And so that population structure does re reflect some historic boundaries, um, or barriers, and, and as well as contemporary factors. And by that she was referring to particularly between east and west. You know, remember I, I mentioned all of those wetlands and marshlands and things like that. So there, there probably historically wasn't a huge amount of east-west movement going on just because of that. And through the magic of some of the, the genetic modeling that she was able to do, she estimated that there was about a 76% reduction in, in population size from historic levels. How they get to that, I don't know. You'll have to contact Tammy about that. It's, it's like I said, some of the genetic modeling magic um, with a reduction in migration rates that they were able to document as well. Interestingly, when she kind of summed up all of her numbers, you know, again, use the magic of genetics to estimate population size, she came out somewhere around 2,500, which is not too far off from the 3,000 that I kind of pulled out of my back pocket. So that was kind of comforting. Um, a little disturbing because her number is even lower than my number, but like I said, I think my number was a little bit optimistic anyway. Again, just not a whole lot of these guys out there, but some of this genetic work is still continuing. Uh, one of the big projects that was done back in the 90s was looking at oil field effects. And this went on for years out at Elk Hill. That was actually one of the first projects that I, I worked on when I came out in 1990. Uh, the California Energy Commission also had a nice study that went on from 88 to 92 from the Spiegel network uh, down in the low current area. And the results were pretty similar. You know, we, we weren't finding real severe impacts for the most part, particularly when you had low density of wells, like you see in that, that upper image. When you get down to those higher densities of wells, you actually still have foxes using those areas, but as you can well imagine, the numbers are low, the densities are low. Um, so again, where you can kind of keep the density, the well density lower, you know, and it doesn't seem to have a real severe impacts on, on the foxes. And we, we presented all of our stuff in the big wildlife society monographs, so you can read all about it in there. The, the bottom line is that there wasn't a, you know, um, a really profound effect from, from the oil fields. Uh, agricultural lands, that was a little bit of a different story. So we did about a two-year study where we had foxes, uh, radio collar, you know, right next to ag lands, and pretty much found that they don't really like them. Um, they would go out in the, in, at night, you know, maybe as much as a half a mile and forage into some of these areas, but even that was not that common. Um, and again, it's only where you have the ag lands right next to good quality habitat. This uh, image down below there um, is actually uh, uh, orange groves that are right next to the Bina landfill. Again, we've seen some of our radio collared foxes go down into those um, those groves and maybe spend even a night, um, usually they're denning in a pipe or something like that, if they do stay down there during the day. But for the most part, they would just kind of go down at night a little bit, I'm not quite sure what they're finding in those areas, and then come back out. These um, annual row crops, they, they really just can't use it all. I mean, they're, they're flood irrigation for the most part, so, you know, if they try to dig a den in those areas, their fence get flooded out. They're constantly disking these things and, and plowing them, so it's it's just really tough, but they're really sanitized in terms of, you know, rodents, insects, or things like that, as you can well imagine. So they really just can't use the ag land to any great extent. And then the other big thing that's going on now, um, and that we're just beginning to evaluate, you know, these big solar projects that are going in. So this is the, the Topaz solar project going in on the northern part of the Carrizo. Um, this is, uh, again, Topaz kind of from a distance. Um, there's another big one out there, the California Valley Solar Ranch. You know, these are covering three to 4,000 acres of land. Um, you can see these easily from Google Earth. So that's California Valley Solar Ranch on the right. And that's uh, Topaz over on the left. So again, taking up you know, huge, huge swaths of land. So of course, um, you know, their, their effects are, are something of interest. You can kind of see where these um, two projects are located. Uh, those, those dark areas up toward the top there, those are the solar projects. Um, that big yellow area, that's the Carrizo Plain National Monument. Um, and one of the other themes with kit boxes, um, as I said, desert adapted was one of those things. They also are adaptable enough that 
they kind of kind of create some of their own silver lining, and um, um, I'll show you that in a second. A good example of that. But one of the silver linings, I guess, out of these projects is that you know, again, we're we're not maybe happy that those projects went in there, took up this land, but there's also 30,000 acres of land that got conserved in the process that wasn't conserved before. So you know, all those colored spots you see up there. Um, you know, the tan, the, the red, the purple and whatnot, those are now all permanently conserved. So kind of one of the good things that maybe came out of the solar projects. Um, and we'll see in the long run how well they, they do up there. Um, the studies that we're doing right now in association with both of these sites, um, so we're working with, with Dave Hacker from the department on this. And so he's established basically a 1.5 kilometer buffer around each of these sites. And so within those buffers, that's considered to be on-site, and then outside of that is considered to be off-site. So we have, we're trying to maintain 10 boxes with GPS collars on each of the solar sites, and then 10 boxes with GPS collars on two associated reference sites. And for Topaz, it's kind of those lands that are sort of to the east, northeast, and, and a little bit to the north to some extent. Uh, with CVSR, it's actually down on the, the, the northern portion of the Carrizo Plain National Monument is the reference site we're using there. Um, on both of these sites, they were required to maintain them, maintain permeability on those sites. Uh, so on Topaz, you can see they left this five-inch gap um, at the bottom of the fence, and the foxes just blow right through that uh, very, very easily. But it does exclude the larger predators for the most part, coyotes and bobcats to whatnot. And, um, and so, to some extent, these areas are kind of acting as sort of refugia for the kit foxes when they can kind of get on the inside of that. Uh, this is what the fence looks like over at CVSR. That's a, a fox that we just collared, blew right through that hog wire stuff. So, um, so they, they've been successful in terms of permeability there. Um, they seem to go into the arrays quite a bit. In fact, almost all the animals that we caught that were right outside the arrays, as soon as we released them, they went into the arrays, so, which was interesting. Uh, they seem to be finding food in there, some of the ve vegetation is coming back in there. Um, you know, the rodent population seems to be increasing. And they seem to just kind of like the shade in there. Um, again, you know, they live in a pretty hot environment, and shade is kind of at a premium. So um, again, that, that's one of the little silver linings, I guess, uh, associated with these sites, that the foxes are Still using them, you know, we'll find out to what extent as the study goes on. We're just in year one of a three-year project, so. Um, but this is interesting. This is 20-some animals that, and, and this is basically associated with the CVSR and, and Topaz sites, and those are the locations that we're, we've gotten off the GPS collar so far. Uh, you can kind of see they're just all over the solar sites. Topaz is almost, you know, pretty much covered up up there. Um, and then, you know, they're, they're doing well out on um, the natural lands as well. So, and those are the comparisons we're looking at. You know, survival rates and reproductive rates, food habits, uh, den use patterns, movements, you know, home range size, all that stuff, both, you know, on the sites as well as on the reference sites as well. Interestingly, we've had four animals die so far, and they're all solar site animals. So. I'm sorry, I, I take that back. They're all natural land animals. None of the solar site animals have, have actually died yet. Um, it was all, you know, reference site animals, and, and they were all killed by predators. Um, lots of reproduction this year. You know, the, a year ago, hardly anybody was reproducing on the Carrizo, whether they were on solar site or not. This year, um, all of the animals that we had collared on the solar sites, they all produced litters of pups. And also, you know, almost all of the animals that were on the reference sites produced pipes, uh, produced pups as well. So, again, they're reproducing on the sites, and again, time will, will tell, you know, just uh, how well they're doing uh, demographically and ecologically. This is another project that's just kind of getting off the ground. Um, this is up in the Pinocchi Valley, so that's in the background there. This is kind of an overview from the surrounding hills. So we're we've gone up and we're just starting to, to call our animals up there. Um, you know, whether this, this project will go through yet or not, don't know, but we're trying to gather as much information as we can um, just in case it does go in up there. It would cover, you know, a good chunk of, of what you see in that image. Um, we put a GPS collar on one animal in January, and then also just, we only caught a, one other animal, which we put a DHF collar on. She actually died within about a month from a predator. But this guy's kind of getting around, so he's using, you know, the 
um, east side of the valley there, and actually kind of getting up into those hills quite a bit, but then he's going all the way across the valley floor, you know, getting down pretty far south. Um, so it's, it's been pretty interesting. They're using some fairly large areas up there. And just in the last month, we've now collared six more foxes up there as well. So, um, and I think half of those have GPS collars on them. So in the next few months, we'll be getting a lot more data on this area, which will be a real nice opportunity. And then we'll see if the solar project does go in. We'll continue monitoring right through construction. And I assume there'll be some post-construction monitoring as well. Um, our, our one guy up there with the GPS collar, he did pull off a litter of pups. So um, the larger animal kind of in the background there, over here. Um, no, she's actually sitting over, over here. That, that's mom. Um, and they, they seem to do pretty well. Um, they disperse from that den now, so uh, we'll we'll see what happens up in Panucci Valley. But bottom line, anyway, again, kind of a, a silver lining thing. You know, they have some amount of adaptability, and they are using these solar sites to some extent, at least. So their studies show us down the road. Uh, so that's one of the the big efforts we have going on now, um, working on those those uh, those three solar sites. And this is pretty important because all of these. Again, I, I stole this from Dave again. Um, all these red areas are either uh, existing or proposed solar projects. You know, all these may not go in, but if they do, as you can see, a lot of them are kind of in the pink area. So it's going to be pretty important to know just what sort of effects um, these, these sorts of projects are having on the kit boxes. This is something, um, this is hot off the presses. Uh, this hasn't really been distributed yet, um, but I'll, I'll share it with you guys now. Uh, Chris is actually reviewing this report, but we actually got a little um, uh, squid grant to go ahead and, and take a, a look at uh, or try to model areas that would be uh, optimal for solar energy development. And then also areas, we, we took basically five listed species, kit boxes being one of those, and, and did a composite habitat value for all of those. So what you see up there are on, on the uh, image in the upper left is uh, the areas that are most optimal for solar energy development. That's in the pink with you know, the yellow being good good to okay. And then this habitat value down here, the red is the, the most valuable stuff, the green is also pretty good stuff, the yellow, yeah, it, it's okay. And then again, this was uh, largely Scott Phillips doing, you know, through all his modeling magic, produced this composite thing on the right, which is a little bit scary at first, and you know, when you get the report, you can kind of work your way through it, but the, the thing I'll point out here is that those Areas that are in black or dark gray, those are areas that have really, really high solar potential, but relatively low habitat potential. And that was our purpose, was to find out, okay, you know, where might be good areas to site solar projects so you would avoid conflicts with the species. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is those areas that are in dark red, as well as the dark green, those are areas that have high habitat potential as well as high solar potential. So those are, those are the areas that we're, we're going to see the greatest conflict if projects are sited in those areas. So, um, you know, we, we, we tried to incorporate as many factors as we could into this. It's not a perfect analysis, but, you know, I, 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 you know, I, we're hoping that it will provide some guidance anyway. So, um, not that very many people come in the door and necessarily ask you, hey, where should we put this thing? Mostly they seem to pick a site first, but if you ever have that opportunity, this will be a tool that you know you can use and say, yeah, kind of go over here if you could. You know, get out of this area and pull lot better off. So, anyway, that was a, a recent um, analysis that we just completed, and we'll, we'll circulate that report shortly. Okay, now um, talk to you a little bit about the urban work that we've been doing. I, I think a lot of you are familiar with at least some aspects of this. So. You know, as I said up front, urbanization was one of the, the primary causes of habitat loss, but we, we've had this odd situation, as many of you know, in Bakersfield, where we have a fairly <coughs> kit fox population, it seems. Um, you know, we've been seeing foxes in the city for a long time. Um, wasn't really clear what was going on with those animals, whether they were in the process of being pushed out or what, but we thought, I don't know, they seem to be kind of hanging on in, in a lot of areas, including some fairly developed areas. So. Beginning in 97, we had an opportunity to, to start studying these guys more quantitatively and get some collars on, start following them around. 
Um, and so, you know, some of the results were, as you might well imagine, vehicles were a, a major source of mortality, the primary source of mortality, actually, for animals in the urban environment. Um, and then there were just kind of some novel things as well that, you know, foxes normally don't really encounter out in the natural land. So this was a young animal, for whatever reason, tried to squeeze through a chain link fence, got its head stuck, and didn't make it. Um, this is another thing that we've been seeing, very, very odd. We've had just over 40 cases that we know of of animals getting caught in sports netting, um, and almost half of those animals have died. So why they're trying to go through this stuff, I don't know. Maybe I guess they think the holes are big enough that they can squeeze through, and then, of course, the net kind of gives way and collapses around them, and then they, they panic and they start tangling. Um, this guy was lucky. He was found. If, usually, if they're in there more than about 24 hours, they don't make it. They'll either dehydrate, starve to death, you know, anxiety, whatever, strangle. Um, this one was lucky. It was found and, and it was released. A little pup down on the right. That's in the batting cage net. wasn't so lucky. Some other animals that weren't so lucky, like I said, when they get in, they just really panic and just you know twist around so much that they they pretty much do themselves in. Uh, the animal down on the right was sort of lucky. She survived, but she lost her leg in the process. So um, we've been trying to work with, you know, all the, the schools, park districts, whatever, and get them, you know, to raise, raise your nets at night or to take them down completely. Some of them are doing that consistently, the others not so much. So, again, a, a very, very novel source of mortality in the urban environment. And so these are the causes of mortality for Bakersfield relative to some of the natural lands, low current elk hills, Carrizo, some studies that were done out there. Um, again, you can see that vehicles were the major source of mortality uh, in the urban areas. Um, and predators as well, most of this is, is dogs, um, some coyotes and some bobcats. Typically, they go into the Kern River corridor. Uh, for those of you familiar with Bakersfield, you know, the, the Kern River bed runs through Bakersfield. We don't really have much of a river most years, uh, but there is some riparian vegetation along that river corridor, and that does harbor coyotes and bobcats, and, and we found that the foxes pretty much avoid that corridor. Uh, we've had a few of our radio collar animals go into the corridor, and usually within about three days they're dead. Um, so yeah, predators are a bit of an issue. Entombment, now some of that's just natural, den collapse, others have been kind of construction related. Uh, you know, we've had some, some poisonings, mostly from rodenticides, other contaminants, other weird things like, you know, the soccer nets and whatnot. So this was just based on, you know, 229 animals that we had monitored back in 2001 and in 2000 through 2004. And um, some of this work is, is still kind of on. Um, but despite having basically a, a larger number of mortality sources, their survival rates are actually higher, which is interesting. Um, so you can kind of see the survival rates again for low current elk hills in the Carrizo and the Bakersfield through you know, 97 through 2004, so a pretty good period of time um, and a fair, pretty good sample size, 144 animals, actually we're seeing higher survival rates there and probably because of the, the fact that there are fewer coyotes and bobcats in town other than right along the corridor. And again, they seem to be pretty good at getting across the road, so even though vehicles are the primary cause of mortality, it doesn't really seem to be limiting the population. Uh, reproduction, tons of reproduction um, in town each year, and you know it's probably related to the fact that, remember I said, they're kind of food limited. That seems to really be what drives reproductive success in town because of the irrigation and whatnot. There are plenty of rodents, plenty of bugs, plenty of birds, and of course, as you might you know, imagine, plenty of trash and things like that. But uh, just a, a lot of puppies being produced in town each year. This is over on the Cal State Bakersfield campus. And we're seeing some interesting things too now. We're seeing these sort of combined litters. So there's, hard to count them all, now there's 10 in there, and that's only one of the moms that are actually two moms that were raising their litters together, this over at Bakersfield College, although that den has been nuked now, but that's a whole other rant that I won't get off on. Um, but we also saw that over at another site as well, where two mothers got together and, and basically are raising litters together. So, you know, it's, it's like space is so limited there, but food is so abundant, we're, we're seeing, you know, these, these things that you would never see on the natural lands, like these joint litters. So, a lot of production going on there. 
And so when we look at reproductive success, significantly higher in Bakersfield compared to the natural lands. And, you know, almost 80% of the animals on average each year are successfully reproducing. Um, so that's pretty good. What is interesting is that litter size really is hardwired. You know, it, it's just, you know, the same in, in town in terms of average litter size as it is in Lothar and, and Elk Hills. And again, that creates a study was done during a severe drought period. So. So again, we're seeing some really interested, interesting demographic patterns in that urban environment. Uh, Food-wise, as I mentioned, plenty of food. You know, a lot of times they're just running the trash. There's an awful lot of people who are feeding them out there. You know, we'll encounter those people and they'll say, oh, I really shouldn't be doing this, huh? It's probably illegal. We'll say, yeah, you really shouldn't be doing it. I'm going to do it anyway. They just love their foxes and they just love doing this. So we tell them, well, okay, well, if you got to do it, and at least try to do, you know, give them something like a hard-boiled egg or something nutritious, you know, not just donuts or something like that. Um, but they are finding an awful lot of natural prey as well. Uh, a lot of gophers, a lot of ground squirrels, a lot of insects and birds. So it's not, they're not, you know, existing on garbage there. They're, they're definitely finding uh, plenty of natural prey as well. Uh, den sites, remember I said, you know, dens are a very integral and important part of their ecology. Um, not a problem in the urban areas. Um, you know, they, they build dens in drainage basins, or, you know, the sums, stormwater sums, canals, golf courses, open lots, power line corridors, parks, commercial industrial areas, railroad right of ways, and, and the thing I forgot to add on here is schools. Uh, most of the schools in Bakersfield tend to have family groups on them. All the high schools and more and more of the elementary schools um, we're seeing that. So finding, finding den sites does not seem to be a problem for them. It's not a limiting factor in the urban environment. And here are just some of those examples of dens and open lots, canals, golf courses, uh, the stormwater drainage basins. You can kind of see the, the big den in the back on that far bank there, and even ones that have water in them like this. And then, you know, just very novel places as well. Um, they love portable buildings that are on almost all of the schools in Bakersfield. They get in between them. They get under them. Uh, they just love those things, and we keep joking, well, if you want to create even more habitat for pit boxes, whether it be in the urban area or non-urban areas, just move some portables in and they'll move right in. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll be in pipes. Um, this was interesting. We, we've seen that on a number of occasions and in that lower left uh, image there uh, where, you know, they'll have a den just going right under a road and you know, it's fine there. Uh, they love getting into these planters. You know, sometimes they don't just dig in areas that are, are being irrigated because of the water and whatnot, but then they'll jump in these planters and, and you know, dig a nice den there. So, again, they're, they're you know, uh, very creative in, in their den locations, and they have no problems, you know, finding locations in this urban environment. So some of the management issues, those same portables that they love so much, those are becoming more and more of an issue uh, because the boxes get under there. Um, and the schools are complaining about flea problems. Now, how much of that? I suspect some of it actually is the foxes, but you know, how much that's also the skunks, the feral cats, the raccoons, and everything else that's under there. Hard to say, but you know, it is an issue. And a lot of the schools are now trying to close up these areas under the portables, but then put artificial dens somewhere else on their campus that the foxes can use. And then just dens in inconvenient locations. You know, this one was on the, in the sand bunker of a, a, a very fancy golf course, and you know, that, that's an issue. Um, but, you know, they'll also occasionally build them on construction sites and other things like that, so it just aren't good places for them to den. And then just people management issues, you know, just trying to get the, the message out that, you know, the foxes are fine, just leave them alone, they'll do fine. Um, we've only had three people that have been bitten that we know of by kit foxes, you know, despite all the years that kit foxes have been in town and the hundreds of animals and whatnot and, you know, all the encounters between people and foxes and in all three of those situations they were trying to grab a fox for one reason or another. I think a couple were actually stuck in those sports nets so, you know, they're, they're being good Samaritans. Another one I think was in a pup that wandered into a school and, you know, it was the vice principal or someone who was trying to grab him with his jacket and, you know, as any animal will, they don't know what's going on so they, they're just trying to defend themselves. But those are the only three bites we know. They, you know, otherwise they leave people alone. Uh, some of the other issues that they do have to deal with are these competitors. We, we do have a lot of competitors, uh, potential competitors anyway, in the urban environment. A lot of skunks, more and more raccoons we're seeing. We now have gray foxes in Bakersfield. 
a lot of red foxes, and of course, a lot of feral cats. So, you know, but again, food just seems to be so abundant, and den sites are so abundant that this doesn't seem to be a huge limiting factor. With the cats, um, it's, it's really this odd relationship. I think they both seem to assume that, you know, if we fight, one of us is just going to get hurt. So let's just kind of keep to our side of the bush or, you know, use separate dens or whatever. These two were feeding together at a cat feeding station. Um, we have found cat hair in like two out of a thousand kit box cats. So, you know, whether that was scavenging or, you know, a stray kitten or something like that, I don't know. But um, they seem to pretty much just leave each other alone. So that's not an issue. Skunks we were concerned about, and actually any of those competitors from the disease perspective, because the densities of foxes are just so high in town uh, that, you know, if disease gets into that population, it's probably just going to rage on through. And so we were really concerned about rabies, which, um, you know, there were some incidents over at Camp Roberts where a couple of kit boxes got rabies, and then it was during a time when basically an epidemic among the skunks over there. So skunks are, are, are real disease bags. You kind of just have to watch those guys, and, and we have a lot of them in town. So we actually did a, a study where we radio collared some of the skunks and found out, yeah, sure enough, they and the kit boxes were using the same dens sometimes at the same time. So high, high potential for disease transmission. Um, so we've always feared rabies. You know, then there was a little bit of a distemper outbreak on one of the solar sites in the desert. They got into the kit boxes. So we were concerned about that. Turned out that the disease that really hit first was mange. And this seems to have been spread into the population from coyotes in the South Valley that have had it for a, about a decade or so. How it got from the coyotes in to the kits in town, we're not really sure, but we've had, as of yesterday, because we're still getting 97 cases uh, since March of 2013. Um, so, you know, we've been responding as best we can, trying to capture animals. If we get them um, and they're still alive, we take them and they're, and they're in bad shape, like this, this one in the upper left image, and we've been taking them out to the California Living Museum. They've gotten really, really good at pulling them through. Um, but some we just don't get to in time, like the, the guy in the lower right, and you know, so we get a call and there's a, there's a carcass essentially. Um, so this, this is 100% fatal, best we can tell. They don't seem to be able to recover from it as other canids can. Uh, so once they get it, it just kind of rages on through. So um, doing what we can to try to document or you know, determine where it is distributed around town, and they get into those areas and then trap everybody we can and either treat them if they're not too bad off or take them out for treatment. Um, and then we return them after about four weeks or so after they're, they're all clean. This is kind of an ongoing battle for us. And, and we're, again, working with um, you know, department folks, not only here in the region, but also the Wildlife Investigations Lab as well. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's, it's kind of nip and tuck right now. Um, that said, there still seem to be, based on the big survey we just did all across Bakersfield, lots of pockets of areas that aren't affected yet. So that's kind of the good news. And hopefully, keep the mange out of there. So our research findings on, on these urban environments is that you know the foxes will utilize a diversity of urban habitats. They pretty much use everything but the high-density residential areas. So uh, just you know too many walls, fences, dogs, kids, whatnot in those areas, but everything else, you know, we'll, we'll see kit boxes used. Um, you know, the commercial areas, you know, any sort of open space, school areas, um, just all those things. We're seeing relatively high survival rates, high reproductive rates. Food is very plentiful and consistently plentiful. Unlike out in the natural lands where we see these big fluctuations in food abundance, it's very, very consistent in the urban environment. Dead sites are plentiful. The Bakersfield population, and again, this was just based on some of our trapping and stuff, we estimated was easily over 200. Um, Tammy, I think, put the number closer to 400 or so. Um, and so that, that's, and if that's true, that would, this would probably be certainly the fourth and maybe the third largest remaining population. This might be bigger than Panoche Valley at this point. So, and because of all that, we think it has a lot of conservation potential. And so some of the, the attributes in the urban areas that seem to favor the foxes, that they're small, they're quiet, you know, they're only active, at, primarily active at night, not dangerous or destructive. They can just use these altered habitats. You, know, you hear about a lot of urban species um, that are, you know, using urban areas, but it, it's usually like natural habitat remnants. Well, there aren't any in Bakersfield. There is no sulfur scrub patches in Bakersfield. These guys are strictly using altered habitats. 
They're very, very tolerant of disturbance and, of course, very charismatic as well, so they have that, that working in their favor. Um, food and water are consistently abundant. Um, denning sites are abundant. Uh, abundant refugia and movement corridors, it seems. Coyotes and bobcats are rare. And we're seeing a relatively protective public, which is kind of refreshing, particularly for Kern County. So um, people are very, very protective of their foxes. Um, you know, not only do they see them, but you know, they're always keeping an eye out. In fact, I would say half the mange cases that we know of were reported by the public. So we say, hey, this fox doesn't look right, something wrong with it. You know, can you do something? And so, like I said, we, we try to respond in those cases. We've been challenged on a number of occasions about, you know, hey, why, why are you trapping those animals? You're not taking them away, are you? You're not going to hurt them, are you? So we have to calm them down. You know, we're just trying to help them. We're going to put a radio collar on, let them go. Um, so they're, they're getting very, very comfortable in Bakersfield. Um, <laughs> kind of settling right on in. We're getting more and more images like this where, you know, they're just helping themselves to whatever resources are there. So. Um, so given all those attributes, you know, we think that this population does have a lot of value um, and, and conservation potential. So it increases the overall size of the metapopulation, so of all the remaining foxes. Um, you know, this is a pretty big chunk that we're in town here. Helps maintain genetic diversity. You know, Tammy's results showed that, that you know, they have some very unique alleles in this urban area, lots of diversity. Um, less prone to that environmental variation. You know, out the natural lands, like I said, we see the populations you know, go through these wild swings, but in town, pretty consistent. And so we think that they can serve as a hedge against catastrophic events. You know, if we did have some you know, really, really severe drought that just basically extirpated foxes in a given area, you know, the small we are or something like that, um, or a disease raged through, you know, then we, this population can basically serve as a backup and we you know, could use it as a source productions because like I said there's a lot of productivity going on there. So in essence, in some respects there are surplus animals that, that could be moved um, to, to help repopulate other areas. And then they just help increase public awareness. So people who have seen foxes in town we have found are not only more likely to want to conserve the urban foxes, but that kind of slops over into the natural lands as well. They, they actually are, are more in favor of conserving all foxes. So. Um, and this could be kind of a growing issue as well. So, you know, we, we do have a, a big population in Bakersfield. There's a small population that uses TAP, so they'll probably not exclusively. Those guys are probably also using some natural lands as well. Uh, foxes are showing up in Coalinga. And I can kind of expect that, particularly some of these west side towns continue to grow, whether it's Pendleton City, Patterson, whatever. I wouldn't doubt that we're going to see more urban populations. In fact, that's how these guys might get a really good foothold up in the northern part of the range. I, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's through urban animals getting up there and getting established in some of those cities and then, you know, maybe spreading out into any um, suitable habitat if there is any up there. So just some more images of the, of the critters in town. Um, that's up at Bakersfield College. I really love the stadium there. It was really fun when that big natal den got wiped down. Um, so anyway, we'll continue on. Uh, one of the the other things that we're doing uh, from a research perspective is we're trying to look at the demography and ecology of foxes in as many different areas as we can. And so the, the goals here are to look at demographic patterns like survival, cause of mortality, reproduction, um, and ecological patterns, space use, um, uh, den use patterns, food habits, and then compare those patterns among different locations throughout the range, including both core and satellite populations as well as uh, natural and, and altered habitats. Um, and then use all those results to develop conservation uh, recommendations, uh, you know, just based upon all the, all the patterns that we're seeing in these different areas. And it's been interesting so far. So here are some of the current studies that are going on. Uh, so we're looking at those demographic patterns on you know, those solar sites that I talked about before and the associated mitigation lands down on the Carrizo. Uh, we have a project which is starting about a month from now, um, funded by DLM, where we're actually going to get into the, the heart of the core area on the Carrizo, and we'll be looking at those patterns, um, you know, down in, in, in that natural land. So that's one we're excited about. And then we have the work going on up in Pinocchi Valley now um, on proposed solar site anyway. Right now it's just a, a natural land study, though. Um, so those are the current ones. And we've had opportunities in the past. Um, a lot of uh, information was collected by us in the Low Kern Natural Area. 
uh, the Naval Petroleum Reserves. That's the project I worked on initially. Um, we had an opportunity in 2012 to get onto your semi-tropic ecological reserve. That was that was a very very interesting study. Um, the Bakersfield work that's gone on, and then uh, out of the small site being a landfill uh, east of Bakersfield, we've been actually monitoring foxes out there uh, since 1990. You know, we're we're getting information from those new places. We have the information from these other places, uh, you know, some core areas, some satellite population areas. So. Um, and then we have this wish list. These are some sites that we would love to get into. And if there's any way that you have an opportunity to, to help us through, you know, mitigation measures or whatever, these are some sites that we really don't know much about um, in terms of what's going on demographically or ecologically with the kit boxes. And, and we would love to get into those areas: uh, Kettleman Hills area, the Kern Front area north of Bakersfield, uh, Piyama Valley, Colinga area, and then Western Merced County. Um, that, that circle up there is basically the northern most population that we know of. So it has been fairly stable, small but fairly stable up there. And again, we'd love to get in and, and um, do some work in all of those areas. The big problem is that all of these areas are almost 100% private land, you know, very, very little public land. That's what makes it a little bit challenging to get into them. So. Um, and like I said, we would really just like to, you know, Look at tick boxes demographically and ecologically in as many situations as we can, whether they be you know, grasslands or shrublands or solar sites, urban areas, you know, oil fields, I mean, you, you name it. We, we want to um, get information from all of those areas. Uh, the reason being is that the populations, that, as we have found out, do vary in terms of both ecological conditions as well as the ecological stressors in those areas. And so as a result, you know, we're seeing very, very different demographic patterns and ecological patterns on those different sites. And so consequently, a, a one-size-fits-all conservation or management approach may not be practical or even be potentially dangerous. You know, you might have something which works over here, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work over here. So uh, that's why we want to get information from all of these different situations. Um, and so we want to develop conservation management strategies specifically for each site. And of course, the more information that we can get on each of those sites, you know, sometimes it's only a year's worth of data, other times it's been multiple years. And the multiple year studies are, are very, very valuable. Um, so that, that's kind of an ongoing thing. All right, so we're coming down the home stretch. We're into part four, um, and that's conservation needs going forward. So you know, what, what can we do for these guys um, looking into the future? And so their the conservation needs, Habitat, habitat, habitat. I mean, they're not making any more of it. Um, it we're still losing it. So anything we can, can do can do to permanently conserve what's left will be beneficial. And whether that be through fee title or conservation easements, um, you know, any mechanism we can um, to lock those places up permanently will be valuable. And shoot for the pink stuff. Um, you know, if you remember back to the habitat suitability map, the more of those pink areas we can lock up, the better. The blues are still valuable, but you know, go there second. I mean, if you have an option, the blues are still good as movement corridors and linkages between the pink areas. Um, but we really need that pink stuff if we want to maintain population. So, and then blocks of about 10,000 acres or more, and that's key as well. We think that that's probably the minimum that's needed to support a population, and even that's probably on the low side. So, you know, if you're getting blocks that are smaller than that. It's going to be pretty hard to maintain a viable population in those areas. So, um, blocks of 10,000 acres or more, then it increases the potential for maintaining a population. Uh, creating connectivity between those habitat patches, and that's where the blue stuff may come in, but the more we can kind of connect them up and maintain that, that both demographic and genetic um, exchange between those areas, uh, the better. And then appropriate management. Um, of each of those habitat areas. So exclusion of any sort of incompatible uses, you know, whether that be sense of off road vehicle use or you know dumping or whatever. Um, and then managing the vegetation structure on those areas is also very critical. Um, and we keep talking about the, the, the denser it is, um, the more likely that kangaroo rats will be excluded and that kit boxes will be excluded as well. Uh, none of them will be less food as the structure gets too dense, but they also can't see the predators coming through that dense stuff. 
And then continuing the demographic and ecological studies throughout the range, including um, you know, not only natural sites, but the anthropogenically altered sites. So again, the more information we can gather, then the more specific uh, conservation um, strategies that you know, we can come up with and, and the more effective will be there. And then eventually, once we have all that good demographic information, then I, I think there's going to be a need for a really robust uh, viability analysis, both on a range-wide basis as well as probably something more you know, regional or site-specific. Climate change impacts. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. That could be interesting. I know that's on everybody's mind, and it's a, it's a big question now. And then outreach and education, um, and, and just increasing public awareness. You know, all that stuff is just going to help contribute to the conservation of the foxes. So uh, those are those are the main needs. And I'll just we wrap up, kind of just talk a little bit about um, um, some of those topics. Uh, so here's our suitability, and again, it's the pink stuff. That's you know really what we want to try to shoot for, and then you know maybe go after some of the blue and to kind of link those areas, but definitely when you have an opportunity, um, try to conserve that pink habitat, the real high quality habitat. Here's some areas where linkages are becoming more and more of an issue. We're seeing the range just become more and more fragmented. So this is up in the Pinochi Sananella area. And you already kind of see that the pink is very fragmented there. And even the blue is becoming more and more fragmented. You know, we're being reduced to just these kind of really, really narrow strips. And you always hear about, you know, the, the, the area that's basically west of I-5. That's a really narrow band running from this area down to Curtin County. And in a lot of areas, that's already been severed by agriculture that's kind of moving up the, the, the drainages, the creek drainages. Um, and I think we're just going to see more and more of that, unfortunately, unless the water runs out. Um, so that, that's a problem area. And again, this, this is... Um, some information that, that Dave Hacker has put together. In the Colinga area, there are some issues as well. You've got that big um, uh, Pulvadero gap in there. Um, you know, they're separating some actually, you know, some nice pieces of habitat, so they kind of have to go around that. You'd have to try to cross the ag lands, which is a little bit risky for them, or go all the way around. But even when they go around, they kind of just hit a dead end anyway. So that's an area we can use some more linkage work. This is uh, the Sunflower Valley and Kettleman Hills area. As you can kind of see there's a big gap there. Um, this is, you know, you got Route 46 here. And right now, that only connectivity is over here, but that's disappearing really fast over along that west side. Um, it's thin and getting even, even thinner. Every time I, I drive out 46, it seems like more of that land has been. Uh, that's definitely an area. Um, and then for the Carrizo and the Western Kern County Court areas, you know, there's just these really, really thin strips of blue around the southern end linking the Carrizo and Kern County. And then going out the north there through the, the Bitterwater Valley area, you can see that's just a really, really narrow linkage up there. And that, that, that gets pretty nasty in the wet year. It gets so, so overgrown with vegetation, I really don't think foxes are moving through there. Um, now, actually, with uh, things have been drier, that area looks pretty good at the moment, so that's when we might get some exchange. But again, maintaining some connectivity between these two big core areas is, is definitely an issue. And so that's kind of what the unsuitable stuff looks like, and that's, that's where we really need some management. This is actually the Allensworth Ecological Reserve up on the right. Um, used to have grazing on it way back when, and um, you know, for a variety of reasons it's been, it's been taken off. So that area's just gotten really ranked. Boxes haven't been seen up there in quite a while. One of those leopard users, tipping kangaroo rats, can't seen animal squirrels. So it's not only affecting the foxes, it's kind of the whole suite of species. Um, the other area down there is, is on the, the wind wolves area. You know, again, kind of looking at it from you know, a high altitude like Google Earth, it doesn't look like it should be too bad. But you get down on the ground, and it, it's pretty choked out down there. And there's just, just some portions of uh, Tejon Ranch. Um, when you really get that, that dense avena, that wild oaks, that, that's, that's kind of nasty stuff. You know, it's really hard to get the foxes into those areas. And that's kind of the rule of thumb, actually, just kind of taking one little tangent here. I should have mentioned this in the suitability stuff. When you're walking around on the ground out there, um, and you kind of want a really quick and dirty assessment of what's good habitat and you know, maybe not so great um, for kid foxes, look at your non-native grasses. Um, and if you're, if the dominant non-native grass is either ripcup brome or wild oats or avena, it probably doesn't have a whole lot of good potential for kid foxes. So it's going to be if it's red brome or Arabian grass, chismus, then 
then those are areas that tend to be more arid and have much more potential for the kit boxes. So, you know, as you're kind of doing a site assessment, that's, that's one quick way of, of, of assessing it. And so how do we manage that stuff? Well, yeah, I know it's not terribly popular, but, but grazing is probably our best tool at this point. And, you know, you can actually make a little money off of that. And you really want to get that stuff down to, you know, the image that you see on the right where there's some open ground and really, really low structure. And, you know, whether you achieve that with cows or, or sheep, um, you know, it doesn't matter. It's anything that kind of gets that down, that structure down. So and I know this has been a, a challenge for the department. I don't, I don't, I can't recall any ecological reserves in kit box habitat right now that have grazing leases on them. That, that's, that's been a big challenge for the department. So uh, hopefully that can, that can be surmounted um, you know, in, in the coming years and, and we can get some good management going on on the ERs. And it's not just the ERs. I mean, there, there are plenty of other areas that, that need to be grazed as well. Climate change. So let me just spend about a minute on this. Um, it's interesting. We had an opportunity. We were involved in a project that looked at not only kit boxes, but about a dozen other species as well. This was funded by DOR. And different groups were kind of looking at, at, at a species. You know, they, they, they brought in a number of species experts. And so we, had, we were dealing with kit boxes. And they said, okay, these are the assumptions. You know, based on all the climate change models and whatnot, here are the predictions. Now, you tell us what's going to happen with the habitat for your species. And for most of the species, it, it tended to decline. Kit boxes were interesting. Uh, the red is what's considered to be the good quality habitat now. Under the climate change models, that good stuff expands to the green. So the range and the amount of suitable habitat actually expands for these guys. And think about it, you know, they're desert adapted. And what are most of the models saying? Hotter, drier, more desert-like. The kit boxes are like, bring it on, you know. Um, we're, we're ready for it. Um, and so this is interesting. And, and kind of a little bonus potentially to all of that would be that I suspect a lot of the ag lands would be abandoned you know, under, if climate change gets to be too severe and the water becomes, you know, too scarce, you know, a lot of the ag lands that were habitat that were converted probably will be abandoned and might revert back. Again, kind of one of those silver lining things for kit boxes. Um, um, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see what, what does happen. But, you know, I, I hate to say it, but this scenario was probably the best hope for them to be delisted. It's about the only factor I can think of that would result in substantially more habitat than there is right now. Again, not that I'm rooting for climate change, but at least kit boxes might be happy. So one species might, uh, might, might like it if it, it, it does come to pass. So anyway, very interesting. Everything's not just, you know, cut and dry, black and white. Um, but, uh, at least for kit boxes, it may not be such a bad thing. So in terms of the outreach and stuff, yeah, there's huge, huge rooms for improvement here. That's something our group hasn't really had the funding for, um, nor are we necessarily specialists in that. This is something I'd love to see some other groups really kind of take on. Kids boxes are willing to go into the schools themselves. So mm -hmm. Bakersfield, they, they're on most of the campuses now anyway, and the kids kind of see them every day. Um, so, but a lot of potential there you know, for, for education and outreach. And, yeah, really had the opportunity to do a whole lot of, um, but it's, that's so anyway, that, that kind of wraps up our tour. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see what happens with these guys down the road. You know, that's you know, kind of talked about, you know, there, there are various reasons that they are endangered or probably going to stay there for the short term yet. But there are some things that are going on, both in terms of, you know, conservation research and conservation projects. Um, and, and we think we have a pretty good idea of, you know, what their needs are going forward. So hopefully the sun won't set on these guys anytime soon. That's a, a nice family group uh, just watching the sun set out in the Milkern area that uh, we caught on camera. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Thank you, Brian. Um, does anybody in the room have questions? Great. Yeah. 
grow going towards this obese population. Additionally, I suggest that it's making a sizable contribution to that population. Do they know? My understanding was they can't tell if that's a relative fact or, you know, from old connectivity, but that's actually making current contributions to the You know, I, I find it hard to believe that it's current. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I would strongly recommend just reading through Tammy's dissertation. Um, so, yeah, the, the question was, um, particularly for, for folks um, uh, listening in remotely, was um, on the genetic slide, it looked like there were a lot of animals moving from Bakersfield out to the basically, you know, more western areas, uh, Carrizo Plain. Um, I find it hard to believe that there's a lot of movement going on now. Um, you know, you got I-5 in there. You know, basically the only corridor that's really left is kind of like right along, maybe on the south side of the Kern River corridor. So there could be some, but I was kind of surprised when I saw that too, and I, I don't really understand everything that's behind that. Um, so, and yeah, and it could be something that is more historical. So, yeah, not, not quite sure there. And then just as a follow-up, I found it interesting that Camp Robertson popped into that population. I guess I didn't realize that the connectivity was that. I was a little bit surprised at that too, and you know, and, and currently we don't even know if there are any foxes left over in the Salinas Valley. They they haven't been detected over there since about the early 2000s or so. Um, my feeling is that was always kind of a dicey area for them, um, and that their presence over there to begin with might be more of kind of a recent thing. Just as coyotes were reduced and predator control, as habitat was modified over there, um, you know, through for a variety of reasons. I think foxes kind of got in and colonized there because some of the early reports from the 50s, people were actually kind of surprised to see them there. So it's like they hadn't really seen them before and then they kind of showed up. They got established for a while and now they seem to have kind of winked out again. But I think, and, and maybe this sort of explains that, that connection, I'm guessing that they, those animals up in the Salinas Valley came from the Carrizo. It was probably a spillover from the Carrizo that got up in there in the first place. That's probably why they're, they're closely related genetically. Yeah. Do you see any direct mortality due to environmental contamination? You know, very infrequent. Um, when I was working out at Elk Hills, we, I would say once every five years, a fox would get into a spill. And, you know, why I got into a spill, I don't know. Um, but, you know, and it was only a very, very small number of animals. We're, we're you know, talking less than five over a 15-year period. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't seem to be a, a real big issue for them, particularly the oil fields. I don't know about um, um, you know, other sorts of contaminants, you know, like you know, agricultural sites or things like that that could drift over. Uh, we, we haven't detected anything like that, so all in all, I'd say it's probably not a, a huge issue. That's right, yeah, and obviously, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of areas that we're not even monitoring at all, so could be some stuff going on, but it hadn't showed up, but no one's reported it, so. Yeah. Well, I have something just to share, not a question, but right now there's um, a set of foxes that have burrowed under a Bakersfield residence driveway, and I've seen what the house looks like, and it's beautifully xeriscaped. It looks like the house could be in Arizona. Mm. And they're coming in on both sides of the driveway. And of course, it's a very elderly couple that lives there. And the doctor has told him that if he gets injured or whatever, needs surgery that he won't survive through. So talk about like they're typically not destructive. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And it's kind of interesting to see, actually, you know, with all the water restrictions now, we're seeing more and more in Bakersfield where people have just stopped watering, you know, and their yards are just completely dead. And certainly all the grasses, but in some cases even the shrubs and the trees and whatnot, I suspect the fox will find those very Oh, yeah. If I was a fox, I'd want to live in this front yard. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I think they would move right into the residential areas other than the fact that, yeah, there are a lot of vehicles and a lot of dogs and whatnot. Otherwise, I think they'd have no problem. Yeah. yeah, and of course, this house is next to a golf course. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Coming in online or?
Okay, uh, from Ben Sachs, a two-part question. One, have you seen the effect of drought and reproduction in drought, drought and reproduction in the natural areas? And two, how does this compare with what you're seeing, if anything, in the way of reproductive responses to the drought in Bakersfield? Yeah. Hey, Ben, how's it going? Um, uh, definitely have seen a strong effect from the drought in the natural lands. Um, out on the Carrizo prior to this year, uh, it seemed like pup production was pretty much zilch. And I kind of suspect the same thing was happening in the low current area and probably up in the Chi Valley to some extent as well. Um, just nothing. The adults still looked really good. And, it, and you know, best we could tell, based on a little bit of work we did do at the time, they were consuming a lot of insects. Still finding a few rodents here and there, but, but really consuming a lot of insects. And insects are highly nutritious. And that was sufficient to basically maintain the condition of the adults. Um, but I, I think where the limiting factor comes in is, and it might have even gotten the adults through, you know, um, reproduction and lactation, but then when it comes time to bring food back to the pups, they just really can't, you know, transport enough insects um, efficiently to basically feed the pups. And I'm, I'm guessing that was kind of the weak link. Um, so we, we definitely did see reproduction go down to nothing and, you know, um, um, some of your folks, Bob Stafford with the department, you know, of course has been doing spotlight surveys out there and just saw that the population really, you know, plummeted during the last couple of years of drought. This year we're seeing lots of reproduction. In Bakersfield, um, almost every female that we know of has reproduced pretty much every year. And again, it, it just has to do with that, you know, very consistent availability of food there. Um, they're, they're just never in a pinch there, so they, they, they pull off these, you know, good size litters there and, and it's fairly consistently. Yeah? So how do you explain the jump in Yeah, it was really weird. We got a fair amount of rain last December okay. and it was enough to give primary productivity, the plants, a jump start and all of a sudden we started seeing a lot of rodents. Um, so even though it was still a bit below average, um, it was enough to, you know, it, it was kind of both a, a matter of, you know, quantity and timing mm -hmm. that was just appropriate that it got the rodents jump started. And so we've seen actually some really nice increases in giant kangaroo rats out there um, this year on a number of different sites and the, the boxes have responded to that. So, and that seemed to be, since it was in back in December, it seemed to kind of get things going early enough to actually save reproduction by the boxes. So about the time that they were needing to bring food back to the pups, and you know, that, that was probably happening in March. And by that time, the rodent population seemed to be up quite a bit, so, yeah. Interesting dynamics out there. Yeah.